Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now I'm going to read a little about Reverend Lian Schott. Um, uh, Reverend Lian Schott is a recognized leader in the movement breaking through the wall of American white center, Comber Buddhism, to welcome people of all backgrounds into a contemporary engaged Buddhism. As an ordained Zen priest, licensed social worker, and longtime educator teacher of Buddhism, Shot represents new leadership and the nexus of spirituality and social justice, offering a special warm welcome to Asian Americans, all BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, immigrants, and those seeking a home in the midst of North American societies reckoning around racism, sexism, homophobia, and xenophobia. Reverend Lian will introduce us to the Engage for Noble Truths, a reframing of foundational Buddhist teachings that, that actively addresses the urgent causes of today and offers anti-racist practi practices uh, applicable to our everyday lives. For those who are new to Buddhism and for those who wish to deepen their practice, her book, Home is Here, show us how we may attend to ourselves in the face of racism and oppression and invite us all to return to our individual and collective wholeness. Thank you so much, Reverend Lin. And please, uh, the, the, the floor is yours and we will be here. All right, thank Are you me? very much, Adriana and Annie, Annie for the invitation to be here. Uh, I also wanna thank, um, Gosh, so many degrees of connection. Um, one of my students, uh, I'm on uh, Great and Rancheria land or Southern Poma land, um, north of San Francisco Bay Area in Petaluma. My pronouns are she and they, and uh, I run uh, Access to Zen uh, and teach in uh, various Sanghas. Um, and one of my students, Ellen, uh, a friend who moved from here to DC and became uh, one uh, student of Annie's. And then when I was going to was in DC, gosh, in September, I can't even remember now, uh, just before you went off to Plum Village. So we, uh, we couldn't do an in person event. Uh, so I want to thank uh, uh, Al Alan also and Gail, your student, and then also my student, Yuen, who really helped uh, coordinate everything. Um, and then, of course, to you all for, for being here. Um, <clears throat> I would like to start out with a short meditation. Uh, so uh, this is from the book. Uh, so the book is Home is Here, Practicing Anti-Racism with the Engage Eightfold Path. And uh, yeah, let's begin with a very short meditation. Um, here we go. And my tradition of Soto Zen, ring, ring the bell three times to start and once to end. All right, it is said that in some stories that when the Buddha was uh, trying to achieve enlightenment, um, he remembered a time when he was young and as a prince uh, in the kingdom of Shakya, uh, his father took him, the king took him to a spring plowing event. And in the afternoon, as it was a warm day, his attendants uh, put him under a rose apple tree to rest in the shade. And so when he was struggling in those seven or 49, depending on the story that you are familiar with to achieve enlightenment, um, he remembered sitting under that tree. So this is uh, a meditation based on that and it, I call it connecting to wholeness meditation. So how do we connect to the sense of wholeness that he remembered as he was efforting for enlightenment? 
so we can try it on for ourselves. And so imagine yourself sitting under perhaps the rose apple tree or another tree of your childhood. And I'm saying sitting to go with the story, but of course, uh, the Buddha said you can um, meditate, sitting, standing, walking or lying down. So whatever position you're in that is supportive to you to have a sense of clarity and settleness, So under a tree from your childhood, by a lake or an ocean, or perhaps in the lap of your grandma or grandfather or some favorite person. So you guys just gonna re rest and relax into this place. Let yourself fully be in this moment of stillness and rest where there's nothing for you to do. You're resting as you are in this moment as it is, whole and complete. And as a way to focus on connecting to a feeling of wholeness, I want to encourage you to really connect to a very visceral spot in your body, your physical body, perhaps in the weight of your sitting bones, if you're in a chair or cushion, or the back of the head if you're lying down, the feet if you're in a chair or walking or standing, or perhaps in the fullness of the belly, if that's a area on the inhale. So again, it's about resting into the knowing of wholeness and completeness. And before I invite the bell, one time to end, just really have a sense, again, if it supports you, it works for you to center it onto a body, which includes the breath. Just somewhere that you can connect to at any point to remind yourself to return to a sense of wholeness and completeness. And I'll be inviting the bell. All right. Hey, let's take your time to settle. And then I'm going to uh, start out with a reading. And this is from chapter one. And it's called The Engaged Four Noble Truths. We are complete and whole. The ring of a bell signaled it was my turn for Dokusan, an interview to discuss my practice with the Soto Zen master at this 500 year old training monastery in Japan. I picked up a small mallet and struck the cast iron bell in front of me one time, letting it ring. Then a second time. I rose and hurried down a long hall of tatami mats, the woven straw flooring in traditional Japanese living spaces, passing through the Ihaido a narrow room lined on both sides with rows of individual altars for deceased Sangha or community members. They silently witnessed the swish of cloth 
as my long black priest robe rubbed back and forth around my ankles with each quick step. At the end of the hall, three steps rose up. I stopped at the bottom and performed a short gesho, bound with palms touching and elbows out. Then in one swift motion, I grabbed the end of my zagu or priest's bowing cloth, laid it down on the tatami and folded it into a square. I dropped down and started my full prostrations as quickly as possible. Body crouch in child's pose, both hands outstretched and palms placed on the floor. Then with symmetrical precision, hands raised past the ears and down again before rising to stand. I did this three times quickly as is the custom. After which I refolded and slid the zagu back over my left wrist. One more quick gasho, and then I headed up those three stairs to my dokusan with Seke Harada Roshi, the abbot of Ho Shinji Monastery in Obama, Japan. I enter the room ready to ask the central question of my life. I'd come to Japan after leaving the predominantly white convert Soto Zen Buddhist monastery in Central California, where I had thought I would spend the rest of my life. When I had asked to be ordained after more than eight years of meditative Buddhist practice, I felt a deep calling to live as a Buddhist monastic. But this did not come to be. I left the California monastery after three and a half years there, heartbroken and confused about the racism I had experienced on both a personal and structural level. The persistent white supremacy culture of the monastery made it unsafe and did not support me as a Vietnamese American practitioner. This was true for many other people of color staying there as well. The experience was a huge shock to my understanding of Buddhism, Buddhist practice, and my sense of place in the world. As I made plans to leave that California monastery and figure out how to practice as a newly ordained priest, I was contacted by someone who studied under Seke Harada Roshi in Japan. They urged me to study with him as he was acknowledged as an enlightened Zen master. I had only practiced Soto Zen in predominantly white convert settings in the United States, and I felt drawn to practice in Japan, the birthplace of this sect of Buddhism. I'd been at Hoshinji for three weeks, trying to process my despair from having to leave California due to the racism at my home monastery. There was another American at the monastery, a white woman. Instead of being someone I could connect with, she had harassed me, saying things like, you're good for nothing, you're trash. And after I wrote, I actually remember she also said, you should die at one point. So you're good for nothing, you're trash, you should die, in his whispers as we moved about the very ceremonies and tasks of the temple. I couldn't get away from her either. We were housed in the same nuns' quarters together. We had, we had come to Hoshinji around the same time, so we had similar seniority. And we were the same height, so we were often paired together for ceremonies. Her hateful whispers seemed to follow me all over the temple. The racism I had experienced in California had followed me all the way to Japan. Entering the room for Dokusan with Seke Harada Roshi, I barely sat down before blurting out the quintessential question of my existence up to that moment. Why does hatred seem to follow me wherever I go? I asked. Seke Harada didn't hesitate. No hatred completely. That's K-N-O-W. No hatred completely. 
he answered. Then he grabbed the handbell to his right and rang it vigorously, signaling the end to my interview. I scrambled out of the room, doing the prostrations and bows in reverse order. My mind raced to make meaning of what had just happened. Nothing came. My mind had stopped. A koan in Zen practice is a story assigned by a teacher for you to work with. Various traditions have different ways of practicing with koans, but giving an answer to the teacher as part of the process is a commonality across sects. However, excuse me, how the teacher accepts or rejects the answer is part of the mythology of this practice. A well-known koan is, at this very moment, what is your original face before your parents were born? Many people think koans are paradoxes, but really they're stories to stop your mind, to bump it off its loop of incessant and well-worn patterns of thinking, planning, and processing. Koans open us to an understanding that's beyond habitual thinking. Life also gives us koans. For me, racism has been a koan I've turned over and over. Studying race theory was one of my answers to this koan. Other answers for my life have included activism and various jobs as a social worker focused on addressing the harmful results of racism. All of these were good answers. In Zen, of course, when I say Zen, I mean Japanese Soto Zen, because that's the one I practice in predominantly. In Zen, we like to say, the question is more important than the answer. Why? Because questions often come up at uncomfortable moments. Deep questions arise when we're faced with circumstances in which our coping mechanisms aren't working anymore. At such moments, transformational change is possible if we stay open to all answers, especially unexpected ones. The system of white supremacy centers whiteness and makes itself subject by juxtaposing people of color as other, fragmenting us all into the delusion of separateness. Aware of this dynamic and its harm to people of color, I had to be careful to not simply search outside myself for answers. Like many Asian Americans and other people of color, at some point, I had to learn to value myself, reclaiming the validity of my own experience in any moment and in any condition. Buddhist practice over many years has supported me to return to knowing and trusting my wholeness. No hatred completely. That moment with Roshi stopped my mind from its habitual looping to try to understand racism. All my intellectual theories and years of anti-racist work didn't address my suffering in a useful way at this crucial point of my life. That moment stopped my frantic search to find some reason why hatred kept following me. What I needed was to attend to the hurt and harm from being the target of racism. In Buddhism, we practice to be able to find subtleness and clarity that's not dependent on the conditions of the world. To find such subtleness and clarity, we have to attend to our suffering in body, heart, and mind. The koan of racism was not just something that I wanted to understand. What I really want, even now, is to heal from the hurt and pain I've carried. All right, I'm going to stop there. 
I want to say that today I'm uh, doing my reading a little bit different than usual. Usually I, you know, do a reading and then talk about aspects of it, which I'm going to do. And uh, in the Soto Zen tradition, uh, the Buddha's enlightenment is on December 8th. So in part, that's why I chose this chapter and the meditation. Um, and so um, I'll just say briefly, probably you all know, but I'll just say briefly, um, you know, the Buddha's in, enlightenment, you know, sat under a tree. I kind of prefaced it when we did the meditation. Now, the other thing is that um, what was his drive? You know, part of the Buddha's story is what was his drive or his motivation? What was it that um, propelled him, motivated him to um, look for enlightenment? And so, of course, this, uh, the famous story is that at his birth, um, which was a rather difficult one as his mother died, um, but when he was born, uh, his father was the king and uh, they brought in a fortune teller as is part of the custom of the uh, culture at the time in India. And so the person had said, well, your child will become a great ruler or a great spiritual person. And uh, since he was a prince and the king, as in probably many parents, I know my parents certainly, uh, you know, had an idea of what kind of person they want us to be. So with such a prediction, uh, the king said, well, I want him to be a great ruler, of course, to take over for me. So he confined the Buddha to just the palace, palaces the grounds of the palace. And so he lived a very shelter life of learning all the things to be a great ruler and warrior and lots of pleasure uh, was associated with that, of course. And then the story goes that at a certain point uh, and the version I know, and I think they're different, um, is that he got curious though. And so he talked his carriage driver into um, taking uh, him outside the, pa the palace gates. And so um, this is, a, of course, part of the story of the four messengers or the four divine messengers. Um, and so he saw um, an old person, a sick person, and a corpse. And around all those, there was a lot of um, suffering that was exhibited by those individuals and by those around them. And so, and the fourth person he saw was a mendicant or an ascetic. And that person had a very subtle composure. And he thought, oh, this is what, you know, I'm drawn towards. So he left his life of pleasures and privileges and um, went to go, you know, searching for the meaning in life. Now, the story of the Buddha's uh, life and enlightenment um, is, to me, on the surface, really sounds very much like a personal story of a human looking for understanding life and how to work with our sufferings that we can't escape, for sure, right? We all will uh, age, we all will have experience sickness and we all will die. And so I know I personally, even though I was born in a Buddhist family, um, I, when I, after I was adopted and uh, was an adult, I came to meditation uh, to become a calmer person. I, I, probably, how many of you came to practice? Yeah, yep, that's, you know, I wanna fix something about myself, be better. And I think, you know, it's very common and I think it's uh, noble of us for sure. Um, and it's important. And in terms of healing from the impact of racialized harm, um, so much of it is necessary to heal our, the, our individual harm about it. And in fact, um, uh, We need to do that, I think, 
to find that settleness and composure. Now, having been a social worker too, now I just teach, but I was uh, studied and was a social worker work, working with chronically unhoused seniors um, in San Francisco. Um, it's important to uh, really um, understand hurt and harm and suffering, right? And so, um, I wanted to really talk about how I came to this uh, development of the Engage for Noble Truths. So it actually began um, in 2017 uh, when there was an, another round of, of several sanghas of sexual misconduct. And I went to a Generation X Dharma teacher conference. And so they brought in the right use of power as a restorative model. Do people know the right use of power by Cedar Barstow? Another social worker. Um, if not, I highly suggest it. I mentioned it a little bit in the book. Uh, essentially, it is that um, in any interaction between two or more people, both in individually and systemically, they're always a power differential. So we have to become aware of that and work with that. And it actually can shift at any moment, um, depending on topic, depending on whom you're talking to um, and what's happening in the world, of course. And so um, uh, I left there and, and, you know, and I thought, oh, I've been to a lot of trainings in my Dharma uh, practice years uh, about all sorts of things. And usually a model is brought in like nonviolent communication, other communication things, conflict resolution. And I, I enjoy them all and I think they all have validity and yet, um, uh, I was thinking, hmm, Buddhism, because that's my whole world, right? Um, there must be something in there. And so um, with the support of the Hamera Foundation, which is a Buddhist foundation, I've been developing these since 2017 to be a restorative model. So in this model, um, we begin with the first noble truth is that there is hurt and harm, or hurt and harm has happened. So not just that it's part of life, but to restore, we need to agree on what the hurt and harm is, right? Otherwise, if so much of conflict before any restoration can happen is agreeing on what the issues are. Now, the other thing is that having been an activist and you know working with Buddhist Peace Fellowship and stuff, um, for activists, we often, get this and, and, and many of us when we bring up issues that um, are we see as um, problematic um, we're thought of as the problem right as opposed to uh, we're actually saying and I really wanted to instill that this in the book from the beginning that when we call attention to any um, brokenness or difficulties or challenges um, that in fact um, we're saying, hey, what we have determined collectively, be it organizationally, be it individually, be it governmental or uh, global, um, values or agreements are not happening um, or some aspect of it needs to be addressed. Um, and so to start there, we have to agree on what that is. And so the second of the engaged for noble truth is somewhat similar to the classic, which is what are the causes and conditions for the rising of dukkha, right? So again, in the engaged, you, dukkha is hurt and harm. Um, and so it's similar, except we focus much more on systemic conditions and not just individual conditions. And I think this is especially important because again, similarly, when those of us who are in the down power position bring up an issue, often um, we are thought of not only as a problem, but um, it's often thought of as this is an individual thing to overcome, especially I think in meditation uh, communities, you know, often uh, for people, and I'm going to just talk about race generally, because that is part of uh, essentially most of the book, however, it is about anti oppression in general, um, is that uh, it's something, you know, you take to the cushion and work it out. 
you know, you take it to your practice. Or part of how something becomes traumatic, right? It's not just the incident itself, but how it is um, addressed, how it is held for a person, and then how is it attended to. So in practice, we actually need to um, have the structural support of teachers, uh, Kalyana Mitras, uh, elders in the community who understand, say, like trauma or systems of oppression, so that it isn't just a individual, right, issue to work through. And because of inter internalized oppression, we actually need to, as any of us in the down power, and again, I'll just frame it as race, given the topic tonight, um, is that we do need to attend to the impact of it. I think part of the harm of uh, white supremacy culture, and by the way, I, you know, I, I don't need my reviews, but um, my girlfriend does. <laughs> and uh, you know, somebody was like, oh, she says white supremacy culture all the time. And I do use that intentionally because it's a white supremacy culture is a culture and it is then framed as a, a way of being that we're taught and a, part of our healing and part of our restorative, be it individual or systemically, is how do we not be part of that system, not collude. It's not that we, yes, we can work to, to overcome and end it, but for instance, like white supremacy culture, I don't think it's gonna end in my lifetime. And so it's not that we ignore it, but we don't have to actively do certain things that we were taught as part of our locations in the system. So in racialization, basically we're taught, this is your location, this is how you should behave, and this is how you should stay separate from each other, right? Or how you should interact when you do interact. And so that's, you know, like stereotype, implicit bias, all that. So um, we wanna be really um, cognizant of that. So that's the, the second noble truth, right? That there are actually systems of oppressions that locate us, that enforces, that um, punishes us if we don't maintain these imputed locations, right? And a lot of our practices, how do we um, know it, acknowledge it, and then um, work through it? All right, and then the third, um, of course, the classic is that there's an end or alleviation of dukkha or suffering. In the engaged version, uh, focus more on where, where can we find agency, both individually and collectively, in the midst of harm. Right? Now, the third noble truth is the good news, right? The good news, like it's an end to suffering. So where is it that um, we can know that we do have, that we're empowered, in fact, right, to connect to agency. Um, uh, one way that I frame in the book is how do we realize that our life is not a cage? Because I know as a person of color, as a lesbian, as a gender nonconforming, as an immigrant, as someone who is very, very poor in my early life, um, that often I feel like life is being done to me. And I think part of practice and part of healing and part of restoration is to not feel like life is a cage, but in fact, life is a container, right? That it's not just that life isn't suffering, all suffering, and that there's joy, right? The third noble truth, I could say. Or as you know, I, many years ago when I read um, Bell Hooks in uh, women, Buddhist Women on the Edge, that book in 98, I think, uh, she wrote uh, one line just like went to me, like she dropped the mic, right? Was like, I am more than my pain. Because up to that point, I just felt the pain of my life. And so being aware that your life is more than pain, that it isn't just surviving, but in fact, it's your right, right, to thrive. That's, I think, is what the third noble truth is. And in fact, our practice is to learn to become more and more confident in the third noble truth. Okay. And so the fourth, of course, is the Eightfold Path. And uh, there are eight of them, and they're 
set up in three groupings. Uh, one is wisdom. Uh, and so that's skillful view or understanding, which of, is the Four Noble Truths and karma. So in chapter one, we talk about the Four Noble Truths. In chapter two, we talk more about karma in the book. Uh, and then the second of the wisdom is uh, thinking, uh, skillful thinking. Um, however, thinking is not passive in Buddhism. So other translations are intention and motivation. And I myself uh, use motivation because it, it really shows that drive because how we think drives us into the next grouping, which is classically called the ethical conduct. In the book, I like to frame it as compassionate connection. It's the interactive part. As we speak, skillful speech, skillful action, which is essentially the precepts, and then skillful living. And then the third grouping is called the samadhi, or the meditative grouping, and a skillful effort, skillful mindfulness, and skillful concentration. Now notice I say skillful. Uh, classically or traditionally it is right. And again, the right is in, so in the in English language, in my sense, um, it can impute um, judgment. And so um, classically, the right is about appropriate. I heard from Thanissar Bhikkhu on a tape, not personally, um, <laughs> that uh, it's right as in when you go to milk a cow, uh, you pull the udder and not the tail. Right, so that's the right. So I like appropriate. However, I like skillful because skillful to me um, gives you a sense, and and indeed I believe that the the elegance of the eightfold path is that it is descriptive. It says this is what is skillful as speech, as action, as all the factors, and it gives you tools to develop skillfulness. And in fact, you know the practice instruction of the fourth of the four number truth is to develop, right? So that grouping, uh, I heard from one of my teachers, um, Gil Fransdahl, is why it's a meditative quality and it's listed as third often. It's actually like a bridge. We, we, we meditate or we're reflective or chanting, whatever is your um, samadhi practice, um, is uh, as a way in which we have a container in which we say, hmm, so my value, the four no in Buddhism, the four noble truths and karma is, sets your values, right? Your understanding of how the world function. And so that's your wisdom. And, and then what is the motivation, right? So those are your values. So when you go to, I'll just say meditate, but it could be other practices, of course. Um, when you go to do that, um, are you living in accordance with your values? Or you sit down, let's say, you know, you just tell a little lie. And so you sit down and you go, mm, my behavior is not in accordance with my values, right? So it's a place in which we, um, is a bridge for us to assess and uh, also to, um, you know, reflect on how we can do things differently, which is part of restoration. All right, so that's the summary. Now, I would say tonight, you know, and sometimes uh, with a AFO path, while there are eight of them, sometimes uh, there's a way of talking about it in which there's three of them that are essential more, which is skillful view, skillful mindfulness, and skillful effort. So to me, uh, they have a parallel to what I frame as the essential aspects of, res of a restorative model. Um, and also the way then I um, have the book be in its three parts. Uh, that's on page eight, if you're interested. And so uh, the three ways that I think is a restorative model is that one, you have to acknowledge what is. Two, knowing what shifts are especially needed. And three, learning how to put those shifts into practice. Now, you, this is how I frame it. Let's see if it works for you. Acknowledging what is a skillful view. Knowing what shifts are especially needed is skillful mindfulness. And learning how to put those shifts into practice is skillful effort. Now, um, as I was discussing with Adriana and Annie, um, there were some questions that came up. So I'm gonna throw in these questions and I might, I probably need to hurry up a little bit, huh, with time here. 
maybe. Do I have, still have time? What's my time here? You've got 45 more minutes, no, oh. plus more minutes, yeah. Okay, all right, so. Um, so one of the questions um, is uh, about location, right? And this in systems and and i've talked about that in part um, and I think the other way to talk about it is that, and I think this is. Um, why the first noble truth is you know and and in the story right so um, in the book. Um, I recount at the beginning of every factor and the introduction and the conclusion, of course. Um, a story that, for me, explicate that factor and part of this is, of course, that. Um, you know, Roshi was like, no hatred completely, which, you know, as I will say, especially in my um, North American practice, when I go to have practice discussion or interviews or dokusan, um, I usually like, you know, we talk about things, there's a lot of problem solving, and that's, and that's probably because how, that's what I bring to it, right? That's what I'm looking for. And so when he was just like, no hatred completely, I was like, what? that's why my mind was went blank right um is that in buddhism of course the first noble truth is that we turn towards suffering right we investigate the instruction of the first noble truth is investigation so we turn towards suffering of course part of that is because we're conditioned to turn away from suffering you walk down the street you see something disturbing like an unhoused person uh, you know they i know I can by this I struggle with this too right sometimes you're like are they alive are they not what should I do people ask for money do I give do I not um and so they're oftentimes we're taught to uh you know not not in not say it badly but just certain ways in which we turn away and it's the same with with our own suffering and you know that's why we distract ourselves there's denial and so this is why the emphasis is to turn towards it. Now, of course, um, you know, a, a story I have around race is I know one of the things um, when I first went to the monastery, um, they were having another round of <laughs> working with uh, racism. Uh, and so they had uh, some readings from Visions Incorporated which are actually the people who, if anyone know East Bay Meditation Center, the communication agreements is from Visions Incorporated. And I'll, I'll do a shout out to uh, Ilda Gutierrez Baudequin, who is one of my mentors when I first started, and she was part of Vision and she was the one working um, in that. And there's a story in there that really, um, in, the, in, the teach, in the readings for that, that really points out this to me, which is that Often we're taught in racism that certain kinds of suffering are not the suffering we should be paying attention to, right? And so uh, the story is about how this young man, um, I remember him as eight, I, I don't know, I don't have access to it anymore. Um, he was watching TV uh, with his father and um, Martin Luther King Jr. had just been assassinated. And so he saw all these black people crying on the TV. And so he started crying, but he didn't really understand. So he turned to his father and said, what's going on, you know? And his father said, oh, this is not something you need to worry about. So don't worry about it. And that was his story about how he was um, conditioned, right? To deal with race and in fact, um, many white people or white identified people um, are taught not to talk about racism. People of color, we talk about racism all the time because we can't get away from it. Um, but in fact, many are taught that to talk about race, white people, to talk about race is to be racist. I know my parents are a lot older, uh, my adoptive parents, um, and they never talk about race to me because they were conditioned in that way, right? So the harm of white supremacy culture is that it teaches us certain ways of behaving that's supposed to be our location, right? And so I actually think that when we understand these ways of being taught, um, I know when I, I understand that I was taught this, then I can unlearn it and relearn. 
And this is, I think, part of um, what we can practice. So the instruction of the second noble truth is to abandon. And so, again, one way of th thinking about abandoning is undoing and relearning. So, um, okay, and so part of our practice then and is to, um, and I think in particular, I wrote this book because um, this started out as a response, not as a book, because uh, in 2020, uh, and when another round of anti-Asian violence arose in North America, um, a whole bunch of Asian American students who both in my Sangha and in the San Francisco Bay Area area came to me and said, help, you know, and so we, um, I started a course called Lotus Rising from the Mud. I can never remember the subtitles of my courses, uh, something like, you know, uh, oh, a restorative practice for Asian American. Um, and then with the murder of George Floyd, then we did the Dharma of being anti-racist, skillful engagement, something like that, um, it's for all locations. Because part of it is we, um, the, the AFO path supports different ways, like so how did we learn speech? How did we, um, how can we relearn or recenter the way we um, talk, for example? Um, and then we also need to, um, the course is very much uh, yes on the AFO path, and but it's, main point is to um, every other session we um, do processing in affinity groups so we create a brave container for our, for each group to discuss things because there are nuances and i know i did a workshop half day workshop um related to the book at brooklyn zen center in early october and um i know afterward uh, many white folks um we're like, wow, this is great because um, we don't get to talk about this, especially in Dharma centers, right? Um, there was actually really sweet, a black woman came and um, she came because her uncle had recently died and he practiced Buddhism. So she, at his deathbed had said, um, I'm gonna go to a Buddhist center to, um, you know, to honor you. And, um, during halfway through the workshop, she's like, I didn't know anything about Buddhism. Do you guys do this kind of work all the time? This is the kind of things you guys do because I want more of this. And I was like, eh, no, this is not the way we do things. Or you, you know, a lot of Buddhists in there, we don't deal with this kind of stuff, right? So um, having the container to really process the suffering that has impacted us all. Right, with white supremacy culture, I think is really important. And this book is centered on um, Asian American, BIPOCs and Asian American in particular, because while I completely um, see and uh, believe in uh, and witness anti-Blackness worldwide, um, to me, often race dialogue in the United States is often framed as a black and white issue. And uh, those of us, the other people of color, um, are, are often not in that discussion so much. And um, yeah, especially around the Dharma. So um, it is uh, from an Asian American lens. And I will say it was a struggle, you know. Um, I wrote the book because students from both the um, two, two rounds each of Lotus and Dharma being anti-racist um, wanted a more germane book, more contemporary, and one very specifically about race. Um, so I wrote it as a accompanying that. And then as uh, I've been approached to write a book a while back, um, I send it out. And I actually send it to North Atlantic Books because they um, printed um, Be the Refuge, also uh, one of the few addressing uh, Asian Americans, uh, Buddhists in North America. So, um, and you know, they picked it up, which I was, I'm very happy about. All right, so part of it is learning to um, turn towards ourselves and our, our, our suffering. Uh, you know, I have a podcast called uh, opening Dharma access, listening to BIPOC teachers. 
And a while back, I uh, interviewed um, Nolyway Alexander, and we were talking about how so much of practice, especially, you know, we were talking about retreat in particular, and she was talking about um, going to the first BIPOC retreat at uh, Spirit Rock, how it was so great because um, she could reach the edges of her suffering, and it felt held. And I, I think that's true that we, um, you know, part of what happens is that we have an idea, again, some con condition and internalize of how much we can hold our suffering. And so much of our practice is to realize that, oh, let's say I think this, I can only hold my suffering this much. But we, as we go and we meet those edges, they start to soften. Right? We soften, and therefore the solidness of what we think are the edges also soften. For instance, uh, having left Vietnam from adoption in part because my birth mother was dying of cancer and way too poor to find someone to take care of us, um, I uh, left before she even died. And so grief was huge. And then that's the whole thing about not being able to go back to my country for many years. Um, and so I always thought I couldn't survive my grief. Right? And so once, however, I could meet my grief more and more, um, it actually, the irony of practice or, or reaching those edges in my experience is that um, when we build a capacity, which concentration I think helps a lot, um, helps us to relax. And so the, again, those edges become wider and become less solid. And so our sense of ourselves also expand, right? Racism or other or oppressions limits our sense of self. Our practice expands our sense of self. It, it doesn't take away the definitions of the different selves, but it reminds us that it arises out of conditions and those conditions Remember what? We don't have to agree to those conditions, nor take our locations in those. And we practice this to see the emptiness of those conditions, of course, right? All right. Uh, what else do I want to say about this? Okay, so the next question um, was about how um, on page 24 and 25, I talked about how, um, you know, the the young black woman who um, asked Merriam Webster to define racism as a structural definition. Do you remember that? Right, and I'm pretty sure it was 2020, right? So um, because it's in that when it kind of blows your mind, don't you think that it took until 2020 for for a definition to include that racism is a structural issue and not just a personal thing. Um, and so true, it's not a, maybe a policy change, but of course language reflects how we view the world, skillful view. And so it becomes skillful mindfulness to attend to. I define mindfulness in two ways. One is that it's the practice of mindfulness, which is to remember, which is the word, of course, uh, sati, to, or to recollect like what we're doing, the motivation for what we're doing, how to do something. Um, and then the quality of mindfulness, I find to be, um, my analogy for it is kind of like the manager at a restaurant, right? So mindfulness, um, is aware of what's going on and it has because of concentration it gives you a sense of centeredness and then it actually says hey you're practicing paying attention to your breath you're not practicing listening to the dog barking outside the window and then going oh you know why is my neighbor right come on back so it manages it right um, it helps to, and then it does it when it's settled enough with concentration and you practice it, then it does it in a way. So the quality of how that's done is also important, right? So, um, so part of healing from white supremacy culture is, of course, to heal the impact on us. And uh, as BIPOCs, 
uh, we're often taught that our suffering is not important. Um, and so, or it's only important in, in our own communities or in certain contexts. And so we want to really, of course, attend to the personal impact. And uh, we want to see the systemic, or again, that's a second noble truth in the engaged version. So one way to talk about that in the book um, that I framed, and it really it came about when I gave a Dharma talk on the 50th anniversary of the March on Selma. And um, I was talking about our interconnectedness, uh, which comes from the uh, Avatamsaka Sutra, the Net of Indra. Do people know the Net of Indra or have heard of it? So usually it's talked about as um, or described as. So there's a net that's the universe. And um, at each place in which the strands cross, there's our nodes. And at each node, there's a jewel. So it's a jewel of the net of indoors, right? So um, the nature of jewels is to reflect. And so as the jewels reflect around, we reflect each other, right? You and I, reflect each other, we're interconnected in that way. And that's, it's a beautiful image. Um, however, when I was giving that talk, I thought of that, of course, about interconnectedness. And then having been a social worker, um, I thought about the matrix of domination or the matrix of oppression by Patricia Hill Collins. So uh, I'm pretty sure she used the word intersectionality, but I know it's given credence to um, Crenshaw, but um, she talked about, in particular, I think it was 98 uh, when it came out, she was a sociologist, or is, sorry, is a sociologist, and she talked about the intersectionality of race, gender, and class, right? So having those, I, I had a mind meld, and um, I thought, oh, yeah, we need to think about the strands of the net, the unity that we often talked about in practice isn't about that individual jewels should be the same. I mean, that's a nice idea, right? But it isn't true, it isn't as is, right? In the system of say, again, racism or white supremacy culture, um, what is it that some jewels are bigger than others because they have more resources? So the strands are built more to give them more resources. In other areas, um, the strands are not attended to, and so they're broken, right? Or when there's a lot of resources going to, um, all right, bye, Ben, um, to a certain jewel, the size of the jewel can get bigger, and so it, a strain on the net. And so the integrity of the net is the oneness, not what, Yes, we should, of course, attend to the jewels because the jewels are part of the net. And what if our focus is not on individuals, but on the interconnection of us, right? That's the oneness. And therefore, then we become stewards of the net. Right? We become stewards of the net because that's what supports us all. And when we can see where their brokenness or you know, in uh, Zen, we, you know, we say ancient twisted karma. So you can think of that as like that, you know, the strands all twisted. How do we untwist them? Where is our work to untwist ancient twisted karma? So we want to, um, to me, that gives it a sense of a systemic lens. What are the policies? What are the, be it uh, explicit or implicit, um, that keep certain conditions happening right? and how do we work with that uh, similar or related to it what other definition do you think are urgent to change in our language uh, to give context to people located in more privileged locations uh, to me this takes us to learning how to put those shifts into practice which is skillful effort right i know that um In many convert settings, um, the EIA, uh, or you know, it used to be called multiculturalism. Uh, now it's DIA. Uh, in convert Buddhist 
often there's a much more of, of focus on how to bring in more black people. And I think, again, completely understand it. Um, and um, Buddhism came from Asia. And so there's a real sense I know in the Asian diaspora uh, community that it's almost like, hey, what about us? Which is part of the invisibilization and erasure of Asian Americans in the United States um, in particular. Um, and so um, I know I'm in a group and uh, there's a discussion about how, especially in Buddhist community, the, the term BIPOC, while we understand it as a United States or North American uh, framing and, and support it, um, it doesn't look so well in Buddhism because Buddhism came from India, right? And also um, more and more teachers and convert settings are, um, are being, who are being uplifted are not Asian. Um, or not, or predominantly black, and so not Latinx, not indigenous. Um, in some ways, to me, the the BIPOC, the the I of BIPOC is a little bit of a throw in. That's, that's my take. Um, and so, um, we've discussed about like how do we perhaps need a different term. Um, I was trying on my. If you see my website. I have a group of uh, who started Lotus Rising them from the mud with me at Spirit Rock now almost two years ago. Um, we they continue to practice with me, and I turn on AA plus, and then to, until I'm still using it. But some people are going. That sounds like you know Alcoholic Anonymous and and other things. So I was trying it on, and I couldn't. You know, I thought Pan Asian too, but I, somehow I, I was still going at that. And then I and then of course we learn from each other, like we're doing here. Um, and a student recently said to me, people of the global majority as a term. And I appreciate it because it's also, as she explained it to me, um, that it also decenters the United States. Right? It doesn't place the view of who is whom from the uh, United States centric. So people of the global majority might be a uh, definition or a term. Uh, now, I was at a talk on the book at, in Santa Cruz at a bookstore uh, with Gil Fransdahl and um, one of my teachers. And um, someone asked, uh, oh, someone brought up that actually in uh, a Latinx person, I really appreciate that, is that um, in convert Buddhist settings um, has been that Buddhism in convert settings is how they put it, um, has been an Occupy territory. An Occupy territory, right? And so how do we address that, right? Which goes to another question from Annie and Andriana, which is, do you think there's a reason for those who have the best seat at the venue to let the ones who are located in the last rows take their seats even for a short period or a specific show. I myself would say not even for a short period, right? I think this is the thing in which is really difficult. You know, many, many years ago when um, Buddhist Peace Fellowship um, had a paper, remember the, the paper magazine called Turning Wheel? And they had a uh, essay article about how a group of um, black Buddhists and others had gone to um, all the slavery points in Africa. And there was a moment in which there was a ferry to go and it was full. And so a white person had moved aside so that a black person could get on that because it, you know, there was much more of a resonance for them. You know, uh, when I practice in um, Thailand, and, and I just blew my mind because it's not the way things are done in my experience in the United States. You know, um, when a bus is full um, and a monk comes walking up and needs to get somewhere, people willingly get off the bus, right? So that, now unfortunately it didn't apply to nuns, 
Um, uh, but it was kind of changing a little bit, not so much to see, but the nuns that just, uh, what year was that? 2002, I believe. Uh, nuns had just been also allowed to go free to the universities in Thailand, the monks had for many years. So how is it that we uplift those who are traditionally um, not given the resources or the access? This is why my group is called Access to Zen. Hmm? How do we make practice accessible? How do we um, uplift Right? That's what equity is. Equity is we realize that there's inequality. And so we need to uh, rectify that. We need to restore that by um, moving over uh, or restitution of some kind. I put that out. Uh, repatriation, maybe. Right? Um, so it, the thing is that someone asked, well, what is the activism in the net of Indra? <laughs> was one of the questions. And uh, I said, well, engage Buddhism, you know, isn't just that we know that there's systemic harm. We have to do something about it. And it's the same with practice, right? Karma to me, broadly, 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 is to, um, of teaching on responsibility right on doing something to rectify harm right to, to restore things to wholeness to restore things to our values that we have agreed upon right? of course you know in the buddha's lifetime um there was a caste system and he worked very specifically against that and then, of course, there's the whole gender thing, the story about um, his, his nun mother, of course, wanting to practice, right? I'm going to just gloss over that because of time. Um, all right, I'm going to end here with the end of the same chapter. Chapter one is on page 31, if you're reading along. The day after that mind-stopping meeting in Japan, Seke Harada Roshi offered me another chance for a Dokusan interview. I rang the bell, did my bows, and went into the practice discussion room, ready to share my insights about how his answer had affected me. Before I could open my mouth, Roshi launched into a lengthy story of Shakyamuni Buddha's life and enlightenment, along with the histories of other early Buddhist ancestors. Then. Once again, he rang me out of the room. We never spoke about my question again. The, the event impacted me deeply, and I continued to turn it over for many years afterward. When I remember my dokusans with Sake Harada Roshi, this last part has always puzzled me. I often wonder what was his point about it all? In writing this now, I have an understanding of what he was teaching me. The Buddha and ancestors were searching for the same things as you and me, an end to suffering. I think Roshi was saying that there can't be spiritual bypass. He realized, and after this, that initial exchange, I too realized, that I was looking for a way to explain away the hurt and pain by wanting to discuss it. Discussion isn't wrong. Theory isn't wrong. Activism isn't wrong. But we can't use these things for spiritual bypass. We can't use Buddhist practice or any methods such as race theory or activism as a way to skip over the human condition inherent in the first noble truth experiencing the hurts and pains of our lives. Trying to get away from them via any method is to try to skip over or bypass fully exp experiencing our life as it is. Our practice is to get closer and closer to know it completely because in doing so, we can actually then have more clarity on how we can heal. In Pali, 
the first recorded language of Buddhism, the term Yonaso Manasikara is usually translated as wise attention. It can also be translated as attention that takes the whole into account. This is what Sake Harada Roshi was pointing me toward. The practice of investigating dukkha, which sees it in context, in totality, and not just the hurt and pain of the moment. Then the rest of the engaged Four Noble Truths offer us descriptions and practices for how to connect or reconnect to the wholeness of life, that our existence is seen, relevant, healable, and valued. When we remember and access the context that validates us and support us to thrive. Additionally, we need to remember that all beings want the same, to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. This is what connects us all. Denying that systems of oppression exist is to deny reality as it is. Learning to negotiate these systems with self and collective determined agency is the practice of engaged liberation. In practicing collective liberation, this is what I wish for us, that we may come home to a sense of wholeness grounded in what is safe and of value to all. May we then aspire to spread that out, to work together to strengthen safety and care for each other. This is the work and the liberation of understanding, practicing, and developing the engaged Four Noble Truths. Thank you for your attention. All right, I have a little time for questions and I want to encourage um, if you tend to move back to move forward and if you tend to move forward to move back. Uh, feel free to use your digital hand because I can't see everyone or put your question in the chat. I explained it so well. Well, anybody have any questions you want to ask or, yeah. Wow, oh, you did explain it well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take comments then. Or maybe what resonated. All right, Laura. Sorry, I can't uh, come on screen right now, but sure. just was um, wondering uh, how often you offer um, opportunities to study with you on, or in your Sangha on these topics. Uh, yeah, well, we it's just kind of embedded in our, our group. However, I will be offering the Dharma being anti-racist February 6th, I believe, on Tuesday nights for 12 weeks. Um, it's on the webpage, access to zen.org right now. Um, we're not taking application yet because the team is just, in fact, we have our first team meeting tomorrow. So the other teachers will be Crystal Johnson who develop uh, with others, White and Awakening um, at East Bay Meditation Center, uh, Dalila Bothwell, the Insight Community. Uh, she used to be co-director, I believe, uh, at New York Insight. Um, and Bruni Davila, who was one of the first uh, people that uh, saw the uh, my Engage for Noble Truth and was like, yeah, so I'm really happy that uh, they can, are going to be back uh, or c coming to be part of the team. So that feels like a nice come around. And then uh, Jacoby Ballard will be. So uh, we will um, 
try to have small group. Well, we will have small group, but we're trying to keep them at eight. We'll have two small groups for each teacher so um, so that we can have discussions um, that are, you know, anyway, small groups so that we can have real discussions as opposed to just um, being rushed. So uh, once it opens, I encourage people to, read, we will um, prioritize early registration. We also do ask that um, people take it as fully as possible um, because it is dependent upon a cohort. So you, you go into a cohort and you stay in the same cohort. And then every other week uh, is a teaching. The next time is discussion and meditation, of course. And then um, you also get assigned uh, Kalyana Mita or Mitra in between. So there's also ways of interacting within your affinity group. Thank you so much for that. And uh, thank you for this talk. Thank you for your book, which I'm in the process of reading and really appreciating all the um, deep and reflective thought that you've put into formulating um, everything, all the gifts you're giving us with this book. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Looks like La put something in the chat question. Okay, I'm trying to find it. What would a dominant culture Sangha truly doing their anti-racist work look like? More intention than action. Um, so they would do something like take the course, not that I'm selling a course, but taking the course, find uh, yourself in situations in which you um, are actively engaging in the topics right having more discussion being brave um, the other thing you know which i talk about later in the book is that we often think liberation is uh transcendent <laughs> and also that it's somewhere we go to <laughs> uh, i know the way i've been taught uh, liberation is right here and right now um and um it's a lot about not knowing. And so we have to approach part of bravery, I think, is not knowing. And so part of while we create the safe space, which and part of that safety, or excuse me, the brave space, which we have hope there's some safety, but we call it brave because you have to be willing to make mistakes. Um, and also, uh, you know, every mistake is a learning opportunity, so you have to be open to that. I think, um, as I was saying, I think that the other hardest part is to um, uh, actually promote um, inclusiveness, not only in the lower spectrum of the organization, but actually in, in uh, leadership, like for a long time, you know, I, I mean, I was part of the group that um, at Spirit, I, I started on um, the Spirit Rock tradition and um, it was a group that basically got the um, community Dharma leadership program to start. And um, also like that scholarships had to be transparent and, you know, for a long time, I was like, oh, it's good that there's more that the people of color retreat happens, but you need more teachers. So it's a great thing when there was teacher training and I, I see that they and, uh, and IMS and um, IRC Gills Place, they're very intentionally doing that. I think making access to that is, is the key. Scholarships, monetary access, uh, I think, um, also, um, access is not only monetary, but access is um, another way that I put that I started to develop and I actually um, wish I'd done more in the book is that the whole up and down power thing, right? Now, the thing is that any of us in the down power position, uh, again, on let's say race, um, when we're in the position of uh, DEIA work, say, um, actually, we have 
we actually need more support because one, we have vicarious trauma and then we have to attend to ourselves as we speak for those who don't feel safe enough or, or make, you know, make it visible for those who, who are afraid to be visible on that. And so my wish is that organization would say, oh, I get that. So you need more time off. You need more time to be with other people of color. You need to ways to process it and um, and um, not only give the time and effort, but also um, of course, white people have to do their own work. And this is why you know white and awakening. I, I know for a long time a uh, 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 center that I associate with a lot this is a, a little while back, but because um, I stopped asking because I was wanted me to have a people of color group and I was like, nope, not going to do it till you have um, address white privilege and entitlement. You know, and I, I my experience is people do it to a certain extent and then they drop it when power shift is needed. So you got to give up power, you got to move over. And like I said, I don't want it to be just for a short period and no tokenism seems like there's a bit of tokenism happening, right? So, um, and you know, and that, by that I don't, I think we, all of us need to, um, that's a part of honesty, you know? Honesty is say, ah, it's like this. And especially, and, and so much of our practice is to, um, learn to be with uncomfortableness and it's uncomfortable, you know, and then especially when we have um, section intersectionality of oppression, sometimes this is why we do have to attend to the impact of whatever target or down power position that you've had, because when that's more settled, we have the space for to hear other people's and to include it. Yeah. And, and so, so much of our practice is actually expanding, not even though skillful, I, I like skillful view more than skillful understanding, because I think there's a little bit of a um, miss in my mind, uh, overemphasis in um, anti-racist work uh, that for white folks, they need to understand all the people of color. And um, I think it's useful. It's not that it's not useful, but it's hard to understand each you know, you, in a way, you will never understand my experience, just like a, a, a male person um, who is in male dominated environment, can't, you know, isn't it, and they're not willing can't understand um, female identify culture fully, right. And so it's not so much that um, we have to understand completely. I think there's some, some sense in the work that I have to understand other people completely. What we need to do is make space for people to inform us of what they're suffering and what's needed for them. You know, there's a Dogen quote that I like. Um, and Dogen goes, you know, to think that you, this from the Genjo Koan, to think that you go forth and experience the myriad things is delusion that the mirror things come forth and experience themselves is enlightenment. So enlightenment isn't, I get to go understand everything. Enlightenment is I make space for everything to inform itself and me, have space, have value, have validity, right? Both internally, you know, this is why overcoming internalized stuff is we go, oh, oh, yeah, that has value. My, my suffering in this way has value and I need to attend to it, even though the dominant culture might be saying, no, no, push through or, or whatever. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, you know, when I first thought that I was like, oh, that works for me because it seems so it seems doable. You know, I think that's the other thing about anti racist work. So many of us are like, ah. Oh, it so feels overwhelming and, and it is overwhelming. So, so, so the other thing I would say is community, of course, Sangha, right? And, and venues like this, right? I, 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 by the way, I want to really say that um, when I had my discussion with Annie and Adriana about this, um, they were like, oh, it's making visible. So 
go ahead. Whatever you need to make it visible. Um, and because so much of the book is about the erasure and invisibilization of Asian American. Um, yeah, and I, I really, um, yeah, that's a kind of movement that I, uh, I think is effective and I appreciate. So thank you. And I'm looking at the time. The other one is respectful of other people's time and energy. Uh, shall I do a dedication of merit? All right. Actually, um, I've been using uh, my Brahma Vihara meditation too, in particular. This is my Mudita meditation. I'll just say the phrases. Maybe you can find a posture that is settled. Okay, we're not pushing through. We're just strengthening our muscles. Of and I like to. I'm not really a translator, but I like to frame um, mudita as inclusive joy. So here are some phrases. So you want to say them gently or and you want to let it land as a cultivation practice or an accessing practice, not a push through again. May we know success is when we've given our best effort. Let us know and enjoy good fortune and success right here and right now, however it's coming up. May we connect to the confidence that suffering and the causes of suffering can end. Let us know satisfaction and contentment here and now. May we be able to connect and the joy of knowing we're all part of wholeness. On your next inhale, connect with how you know that any of this is true and possible. And on the exhale, let yourself feel the joy of the possibility. And then again, on the inhale, locate it. The next exhale, send it out, perhaps to everyone in the Zoom room or in the building that you're physically in, or place, your neighborhood, and then further and further out, so that all beings can sense at least, I'm going to change my thing, however many, 20 or 30 of us in this room that's doing the radiating, feel like coming back, rest in that, and then again on the exhale, we are interconnected, so it's coming and going, offering and receiving. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thank you again to Adriana and Annie for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was so wonderful. We really, really appreciated it. Just especially being reminded of the wholeness that's here and that we can access together and how to do this work and how to find that wholeness. I really wonderful. You can see by the chat that everyone got a lot out of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Adriana, do you want to say anything? No, no. Just remember to buy the book and read it and spread the word about this amazing piece. And thank you again for sharing this. And we are going to share with all of you the recording of this uh, of this session. And.